When you come from a family of tool makers, one thing you inherit is to know that a fine machine is beauty. Fewer moving parts, less wear and tear, easier to service. She's a mechanic's dream. Seeing her here on the ground, you can't know what she's like. Believe me, you don't really know a jet until you fly it. All it takes to keep those jets flying on schedule. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. And today we are finally getting to review the Hyperion from Laurier. Now, I was scheduled to review this uh, last year. Unfortunately, I just ran out of time, as I always do, um, balancing my real job with doing YouTube part time. Unfortunately, you just can't review every single watch. I would like to, but here we are at last. Now, don't forget to like this video and leave a comment. It helps to support the channel. Now, I'll do a quick wristwatch check while we. Um, well, before I forget, if this thing will focus, there we go. This is my darling little Seamaster from the late 50s in 10 karat gold. Or is it 14? I can never remember. And I've put it on the Perlon strap. Uh, this is just a standard black Perlon strap. I think it really, really works, especially for such a remarkably thin, slender... Uh, automatic watch. This has become probably my favorite Seamaster I've ever owned. Um, I just love it, that dial, the numerals. Anyway, we're not talking about that. We're talking about this. Here we go. Here it is. But first of all, as we always do, let's uh, dive in to a little bit of the backstory. Laurier was started relatively recently in 2018 by a husband and wife team, Lauren and Lorenzo Ortega, based in New York City. In only a few years, they have grown to become one of the best affordable microbrands in modern mechanical watchmaking due to their commitment to offering very compelling designs, exceptional value and reliable quality. Their timing was also spot on as they were among the first micro brands to really embrace more classical sizes, just as the trend and demand for it had started to um, change and increase. I was fortunate enough to acquire one of their very first releases, the now critically acclaimed 39mm Neptune Diver, which was wonderfully fun, but at the same time a capable automatic that really evoked the feel of many iconic divers of the mid-century, without being a carbon copy of any particular brand or model. Naturally, after the success of the Neptune came the Falcon, then in 2020 the Gemini Chronograph, and also towards the end of the year the GMT we are looking at today to complement the brand's offerings. So why a GMT? Well, as you can clearly see from their releases, this is an entirely vintage inspired brand, very much focusing on the 50s, 60s mostly, and possibly a little bit of the early 70s with the Hydra II and its twin crowns. In the pre-digital 1950s, pilots needed a watch that could display multiple time zones as well as local time, wherever they were in the world, and GMT, which stands for Greenwich Mean Time, a global timekeeping reference at the Royal Observatory in the Greenwich Borough of London, England. For any Longitude and John Harrison fans that are interested in horology and not just watches, you will undoubtedly know of the navigational, scientific and horological significance of this place. This need became ever more prevalent, especially with the rapid expansion of jet technology and the increasing distance and thus time zones airplanes could now travel. Most famously, Rolex and Glycine were among the first to offer their solutions. The rest of the industry soon followed. As for the brand name, Laurier, it's a sort of, not quite, but almost a portmanteau of elements of the brand's owner's names. And very fitting, as you can really feel the love, attention and detail and passion they both bring to their watches. The diameter is 30 Eight, uh, and almost 38.5 there I would say uh, the bezel is flush with the case so there's not much change there lug to lug we're looking at 47.2 an incredible slenderness of uh, 10.6 millimeters there um, that really is a dramatic departure from the rest of their watches we have a 20 millimeter uh, lug width in terms of weight with the full bracelet we're looking at 
137 grams there, a very modest weight, uh, nothing particularly heavy about it, all too light. Materials are um, 316L marine grade stainless steel uh, with of course this beautiful domed plexiglass crystal and uh, plexiglass on the uh, bezel itself. The same wonderfully articulating three link bracelet uh, with that lovable taper that um, I fell in love with. I've always worn it on the bracelet, my particular Neptune, and I'm glad they've stayed with that because I, their bracelets are great. And of course, um, we should mention tiny little micro screw pins there, which is fantastic. And then we have micro adjustments on the clasp, a double push button deployment, uh, signed of course with their uh, um, Chevron, very military-esque uh, brand logo. This is actually really nicely machined. Uh, the clasp itself is stamped, but fairly substantial, but uh, we have nice, solid action to it. It is entirely brushed. Uh, and then of course we've got some high polish um, beveling, which we'll talk about later. The finishing is absolutely impeccable as always. Screw down crown here gives you uh, 100 meters of water resistance. It is smaller than the Neptune, just so you see it there, but still quite oversized coin edge on the bezel itself and the crown. Uh, no crown guards, so excellent purchase. The bezel itself is 48 clicks, bi-directional of course, as it should be uh, if you're traversing time zones going back or forth. So this will allow you to track three time zones in, in total because of course we have an extra GMT hand. And this complication of 24 hour format is extremely useful, especially if you have family overseas or just need to coordinate uh, Zoom calls or whatever with those in different uh, time zones. We have Swiss Superluminova BGW9 on the dial that is um, generously applied, giving it an almost puffy uh, three-dimensional quality to it. We have C3 on the bezel, so it gives it a different glow, a really nice uh, differentiation between neon greens and neon blues. The orientation is great in low light, uh, thanks to the triangle at 12, you always know which way up it is, and of course the rectangles at nine and three. This gives it much more of a Rolex feel compared to the Neptune, of course. Normally I don't discuss the packaging, but I have to say Laurier always does a great job. You get a, a wonderful little suede pouch, um, an extra screwdriver to make adjustments to the bracelet, a, a nice and thoughtful touch there. It's seldom that um, you get a watch that has actual usable packaging, so cracking stuff. So inside, what have we got? And this is quite a surprising uh, change for them. It's the Soprod C125, which is a Swiss made automatic movement. They've always traditionally gone Japanese. It's roughly equivalent to an ETA 2893-2. In fact, it's uh, almost the exact size and just as solidly reliable. It has 25 joules. It operates at the faster 28,800 vibrations, just like a Rolex speed compared to most of the Japanese that I'll show you here, the slower beat rate there of the Japanese movement based Laurier's. As well as having bi-directional automatic winding, uh, you get hacking, quick set, hand winding, and a decent 42 hour power reserve. There are some concerns uh, that uh, it's relatively untested compared to the more common calibers, um, but I have to say I haven't seen anything online or in the forums or whatever that have um, had any issues with it, so I'm sure it will be absolutely fine. But uh, at the end of the day, um, it, they are quite easy to service, but I'm finding this very accurate indeed. Uh, it was m pretty much about plus eight seconds a day so far, so no issues there whatsoever. But most importantly, we get a quick set 24 hour hand rather than the quick set local time as on the supposedly true GMTs in the past because um, the GMT module is actually built on what would have been the day module in the movement. So um, pretty cool stuff. <laughs> Now the first thing you're going to notice about this is the classic Pepsi 
24 hour bezel red for day of course blue for night they wanted or they were hoping to do a an idealized version of the GMT archetype as the first true GMT was of course um, this color combination not this particular this is the GMT Master 2 my own GMT Master 2 but it was um, quite similar in that uh, color scheme the choice of denim blue and burgundy red gives it a very kind of classy understated nature to it uh, the dial is of course black in a subtle gloss finish and you get a choice of either gilt or silver print uh, for the printing uh, depending on your choice the hands will of course correspond and match the handset is very signature laurier as is these um, angular pointed lugs that gentle uh, curve the the wide beveling there on the high polish these are all kind of signature traits of laurier and I, I love seeing the consistency across the brand so for the handset we have the charming but efficient broad arrow for the hours the pointed minute hand the arrow tipped seconds and then this new hand they've gone for a diamond on the end of the gmt it's in a more diminutive size uh, to reference the very first GMT Masters and the GMT hand is in a cherry red. It's very effective and quick to read as they have all distinctive shapes that differ from one another. Um, so at a glance you instantly can recognize what's what. The decision to have the curvy pronounced uh, plexiglass for the insert as well I think was a really great move because it is so indicative of Bakelite-esque bezels of the early days. The 24 hour numerals in the bezel are in a kind of pastel off-white, almost with a hint of uh, lemon yellow, I would say there. Definitely giving off more vintage vibes. I love how the arrow of the 12 almost looks like it's about to interlock with the Laurier uh, Chevron logo. This is matched nicely by the domed crystal that further assists uh, that feeling of the old days with the rich distortions as you move it, it's very satisfying indeed. If you unscrew the crown and pull it out to the second position, you'll see we have a roulette date wheel, something uh, very uncommon today, but uh, was definitely more of a thing in the 50s and 60s. Again, it's these little devils in the detail that really take this watch to another level. Playful, not necessarily um, well, maybe it has a little bit of function to it, but uh, very cool indeed. The day temperature at the 6 is in a very slight trapezium shape with the narrow end towards the center, giving it a really pleasing sense of balance. I'm so glad they put it there. It doesn't break any lines of symmetry on the dial. And the date wheel being white balances out those markers perfectly. It has that uh, lovely arch to it, uh, hugs the wrist and just guides the bracelet down and that, that taper follows it on it really does remind me actually of kind of components of, of classic 50s uh, caddies and um, cars of that era i love that and if you look at that beveled edge it runs the entirety of the case all the way from tip to tip slightly omega 300 1957 trio style it manages to balance masculine with elegant at the same time the crown here despite being smaller compared to the neptune still very much makes me think of the 6538 submariner from rolex and i'm really happy they did this uh, drilled lug holds because i have a feeling this is going to be an absolute strap monster i mean imagine this on a distressed collar even a nato or rubber strap whatever it's going to work with a lot of combinations. If you look at the case back, they've added what I thought was a barley wheat pattern, but it's actually their logo just repeated in a circular fashion, matching the concentric brushing. Very, very clever indeed. Now, I did criticize on my initial uh, Neptune review that the, the, the plain case back was a little bit, you know, boring, but they explained that it was deliberate so you could have somewhere to um, engrave a uh, dedication or uh, maybe a date or a name or a message or a memento of some kind which i really understand nice touch and you can see if i neglect to mention that the um, end links are solid indeed at the six o'clock we see the hyperion name along with gmt to complement the uh, minute track running around the very edge of the dial and framing markers like all Laurier watches, the choice behind the name Hyperion uh, references another Greek god from classical mythology. 
Uh, this time it's a titan who fathered the sun, moon and dawn, which I really do think is a clever, logical uh, namesake. And also, um, Greek mythology always adds an element of class to anything, really. As always, we'll start with the positives first. Uh, during an interview with the team who created this watch, they expressed their goal was to make a watch just like the ones they did in the middle of last century, during the golden age of mechanical watches. They wanted to capture the look and feeling, as if you'd stepped into a time machine and gone back to that era and purchased it straight off the shelf. Well, it certainly achieves that, but most importantly, it does this without being a straight rip-off of the highly desired Rolex that started it all. It exquisitely blends the now well-established design language of the Laurier brand with the style and feel of that bygone age. The original Rolex Pepsi is admired and lusted after not only for its horological significance, but also because it has a ton of swagger associated with it. Like the Laurier website so rightly mentioned, I too immediately think of Dizzy Gillespie, Chuck Yeager and Pussy Galore. Does the Laurier encapsulate that? Unequivocally. In my mind, one of the biggest positives when it comes to this watch is undoubtedly its near perfect scale and proportions. It's astonishingly slender and wears incredibly comfortable on my six and a half inch wrist. I also think this is going to be not just enjoyable and fun to match with different straps, but also like my Rolex GMT, versatile in different attire. Dress it up or down, it will always work in my opinion. Its more muted Pepsi colour scheme definitely assists here, as my GMT with its more vivid red and blue does tend to clash on occasion. It's elegant enough for formal wear, but toolishly tough and capable enough to use it as if you were Chuck Yeager and testing the latest aircraft in the most demanding conditions. The final big positive here is compared to going vintage. It's far better value, less risky to buy, and drastically less fragile than anything from the time its aesthetics was inspired by. It's one of the most competitively priced GMTs on the market in 2021. For a moment, just consider this. A GMT Master 6542 in the 1950s cost around 240 bucks. In today's money, adjusted for inflation, it's roughly around $2,000. Naturally, with the Rolex, you are paying more for the brand prestige, high quality and associated history. So at under $800, I think the price point is extremely fair for what you get. One last minor aspect I would like to add is I appreciate the choice of having gilt or silver dial options. For me, that versatility is boosted even further as I feel it subtly complements my yellow gold jewellery, like my wedding ring or my signet ring. So let's talk negatives. Well, first of all, those who um, are not modestly wristed, is that even a word? Uh, <laughs> those uh, that also desire something a little larger, um, or perhaps don't want to embrace the more mid-century sizes, uh, might feel a little left out in the cold with this. Personally, I felt the tip of the GMT hand was a little bit too small. I'm not sure if that's because I'm just so used to the more exaggerated size of my GMT Master 2 there, which you can see is quite generous actually. I would have preferred it to be just a flick bigger, um, not the end of the world. The main bone of contention, again, uh, same as before, will be that crystal. Many will prefer sapphire, um, but this was not done for budgetary reasons. In fact, quite the opposite. To quote Laurier, uh, there's a reason why vintage watch lovers swear by the Plexi Dome. Um, because it gives off that optical warmth. And I, I, I really like that phrase um, because it just absolutely nails it. It has a quality that other materials simply cannot uh, replicate. But if you missed my, and I'll leave a link up there, if you missed my seven essentials video, uh, trust me, Polywatch is your friend. I've, I, I used it on my um, gorgeous little Seamaster there. Um, very affordable, very easy to do, doesn't take long. Don't let it stop you 
enjoying this um, and also it doesn't suffer from the glare and smudges that are very prone to um, sapphire glass another negative is uh, the color scheme the pepsi color scheme it will turn some people away in fact actually i wouldn't mind seeing a um, a coke bezel or even just a a plain black monochromatic version i know it won't be um, as indicative of the very first uh, GMT. Another issue is not really the watch itself, but they tend to sell out quick. You might find yourself on a waiting list. Um, you know what? That's a good thing. It protects the resale value, makes it a little bit more exclusive, but it is worth the wait, certainly. Another big negative inherent with all micro brands is the lack of heritage, uh, especially when you consider you can buy um, a glycine airman for around the same money. Uh, thanks to Invicta's distribution devaluation, which we discussed in a recent Watch Talk video. Yeah, you're going to have to come to terms with that. Personally, it's not an issue for me. But think of it this way. Imagine if you bought an early uh, Laurier. The first gen Neptune actually goes for more than they originally sold for. So in conclusion, I really did not expect them to be able to top their Neptune diver there, but I think they have. Um, this has to be their strongest offering yet. It's the most fully realized release. Um, I doubt it will take three generations uh, of a refinement like the Neptune, even though I still actually kind of prefer the first gen, but that's just my preferences. Um, it captures the romance uh, of this bygone age perfectly. Uh, but crucially while still being its own thing and that is what is fundamentally important when you do vintage inspired watches and what every brand or micro brand if you're doing that kind of thing should strive for for me this proves uh, laurier remains at the top of the list i think it's still um, head and shoulders above most other micro brands um, just about in every single department. This has even got me second guessing my own GMT. Um, there's a part of me that wants to flip this, buy that, and then bung the extra 10 G's in the bank and call it a day, or maybe go on a very long vacation. <laughs> in all seriousness, uh, it is absolutely that good. So unquestionably, it goes without saying, certified pure class once again. Um, where does Laurier go from here? I mean, it's like Miles Davis releasing Kind of Blue, or Nirvana with Nevermind, or Hendrix with Are You Experienced, or Prince with Purple Rain. You get where I'm, <laughs> where I'm going with this analogy. Um, how, how are they going to top this? Well, I'm, I'm really going to be interested um, to follow their releases and uh, see where their brand goes. I can't wait. So absolutely, uh, the Kipper's Knickers, well done, Laurier. Absolutely outstanding un piccolo capolavoro meraviglioso all the other um <laughs> pretentious words i use so um i'm gonna leave it there please do add your thoughts queries comments opinions all the rest of it down below um especially please don't forget to like this video if you enjoy these unbiased independent unsponsored reviews please don't forget to like the video all right guys thank you for watching and i'll catch you in the next one okay ciao